Jesus said in Matthew 28 verse 19, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Welcome to Go Teach All Nations, bringing you Christ's teachings through Australian and international speakers. And here is today's presenter, Maria Dominguez. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I just want to thank you so much for the message that you are about to give us. And I just want to ask right now for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would speak directly to every single person seated here tonight, including myself. Um, and I just pray for your power um, and for an understanding of just how great your love is. I ask for all of this in Jesus name, I pray. Amen. Okay, so today the focus of our message is going to be on Exodus. And I want to focus specifically on the Hebrew people. Now, just for a little bit of a backdrop, the Hebrew people were slaves to the Egyptians. These two people once lived together in peace, but then the Hebrews started growing very fast in number and this scared the Egyptians. The Egyptians were afraid that the Hebrews were going to overtake them. And so how did they handle this situation? They made the Hebrews their slaves. Exodus 1, 13 to 14 says, so the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter, forcing them to mix mortar and make bricks and do all the work in the fields. They were ruthless in all their demands. The very purpose of this slavery was to wear down the Hebrews. So you can imagine that this was a very brutal form of slavery. And it's easy to kind of read these Bible stories and think of these people as just mere Bible characters. But it's always important to remember that these were people with, um, these were real people like you and like me and with a very real suffering. Young boys grew up with only one purpose in life and that was to become a slave. The men were abused and the women watched their young children get slaughtered. This is a story of a very dark time in history for God's people. But it is also a story that is relevant to our time and place today. Here in Australia, we don't really have literal slavery, but there is another form of slavery that we do have, a spiritual form of slavery, and that is slavery to sin. 2 Peter 2.19 says, They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption, for you are a slave to whatever controls you. Coming back to the Hebrews, there wasn't just one generation of slavery. These people were in slavery for 430 years. And what this means is that they weren't just slaves for themselves. They watched their parents be slaves. They watched their grandparents be slaves. They heard stories of their grandparents' parents as slaves. Slavery was basically all that they had ever known. And perhaps many of these people even considered slavery to be a part of their very identity. And unfortunately, it's not very different when it comes to slavery with sin. We are surrounded by it. We live in a society that normalizes it. And as far as the human race is concerned, it is all that we as people have ever known. Um, one can be a slave to many different things. There is money, there is food, there is lust. Um, these are just examples, there are many more. You're a slave to whatever controls you. And I just want to say, um, I feel like it's important for me to say from the very beginning of this sermon that uh, I am not up here to condemn anyone or to make anyone feel bad. I'll be sharing my story a little bit later on. Um, and you will see that I'm truly absolutely no better than anyone in this room. But I am just here to say that we do not have to be slaves. Um, this does not have to control us. You see, God wasn't just going to leave his people in slavery. He made a promise to the Hebrews. The Hebrew slaves cried out to him and God came personally to speak with a Hebrew man providentially raised as an Egyptian and his name was Moses. Uh, we all know who Moses is. Exodus 3 verse 1 to 2 says, One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of the bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. The angel of the Lord. Who is this angel of the Lord? This man is found all throughout the Old Testament. And if you do a study just on him, you will find that he is responsible for three different things. One, he speaks as God. Two, he speaks under the authority of God. And three, he identifies himself with God. This angel of the Lord is Jesus. Here, all the way back, 
back um, in the Old Testament, over a thousand years before Jesus actually came to earth as a man, we find him here speaking to Moses through a burning bush and speaking to him to deliver a special message. Exodus 3 verse 7 says, Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. The Lord is not blind to our suffering. He hears every single cry and he holds every single tear. And in Exodus 3, 16 and 17, he goes on to say, Now go and call together all the elders of Israel. Tell them Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob has appeared to me. He told me, I have been watching closely and I see how the Egyptians are treating you. I have promised to rescue you from your oppression in Egypt. I will lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Here the Lord was calling Moses to remind the Hebrew people of a promise. You see, this wasn't a new promise. Um, God was referring to himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because he wanted them all to remember an older promise. You see, God first made this promise of the promised land to Abraham all the way back in Genesis. And then he gives this promise a second time to Abraham's son, Isaac. And then uh, later down the track, he confirms this a third time to um, Isaac's son, Jacob. And this is really beautiful. Here, Jesus Christ is speaking as God and he's saying, look, I have made a promise to deliver my people of, from slavery and take them to the promised land long ago. I have not forgotten my promise. Trust me to keep it. You see, Jesus didn't look at these people and just see slaves. He looks at them and he sees his people and he wanted to give them a whole new life and a whole new identity. The same promise is made to us today. Coming forward to the New Testament, uh, John 8, 36 says, So if the Son sets you free, you are truly free. And that Son is Jesus. It is Jesus' delight to come to people whose slavery to sin is all that they have ever known and to set them free, to give them a new life and a whole new identity. Let me share a story with you. It is a story of a prostitute. She has been a prostitute since her teens. Her mother was a prostitute and she grew up in the party scene. And this life, you could say, is basically all that she had ever known. On late nights, her face would be covered with dark makeup to give an appearance of beauty that she couldn't really see in herself. And on late mornings, she would be crying all of this makeup off with tears of self-hate, wishing that she could be someone else. One day something both amazing and strange, and strange happens. A man comes up to her and this man offers her more than her usual price. This man says to her, how much do you charge? Oh no, the, yeah, the man says to her, how much do you charge? And the woman names her price. And he looks at her and he says, too cheap. You are worth more than that. The woman kind of pauses and then she says, okay, how about we double the price to them? And the man looks at her again and he says, still too cheap. You are worth far more than that. This conversation goes on and on. The woman keeps raising her price and the man keeps saying that she's worth way more than that. And eventually this prostitute starts to feel very frustrated. She begins to question whether or not this man is just playing with her. And she looks straight at him and she says to him, what, are you the richest man in the world? And he looks back at her and he says, perhaps, perhaps not but I know value when I see it. And you are extremely valuable. You are worth all that I have. This woman's uh, anger begins to subside. She looks up at this man and she says to him, okay, what then do you want from me? And this man looks back at the woman and he says just one thing. I will give you all that I have. You will never need anything again. I promise to supply all of your needs. I only ask for one thing in exchange. Never again sell yourself to any man. This woman, she looks at this man like she's, he's crazy. And he says, what? Can't you see that I am a prostitute? And this man says, yes, I see what you are, but I do not see a prostitute. I see a precious woman a lovely lady, enslaved in a life that she does not really want to live. So I am offering you a way out, a whole new life and a whole new identity. This is a picture of God's love. 
And this is a picture of Christ's redemption. I've experienced God's love and redemption in my own life. I was a slave in my mid-teens. I was a slave to drug addiction. As with most forms of spiritual slavery, it did not start off as slavery. For me, it just started off as fun, just another activity that I would do with friends. And then a few years in, I found myself smoking weed every single day and taking party pills every single weekend. Eventually, I dropped out of school after year 10, and I soon found my whole life revolving around this addiction. I remember I would always go to the exact same house to do so. It was my friend's house. She didn't live very far from me, and I remember I would go to this house, I would walk inside, I would sit down on my friend's couch, I would start smoking, um, and I remember there was this window um, on the wall opposite the couch. It was a little window on the top right of the wall, and I remember as I was smoking, I would look out this window, and it would be such a beautiful day outside, and the sky would be so blue, and I would think to myself, I wish I was out there doing something with my life not just sitting in here and letting it all waste away. But then the very next day, I would leave my house, come back to this house, and do the same thing all over again. This is what addiction looks like. This is what many kinds of slavery to sin looks like. It doesn't start off as an addiction. You fall into it. You begin to resent it. And by this point, you cannot find your way out. I remember coming home, and I could see that I was breaking my mother's heart. Uh, you see, when I, when I saw this, um, it, it did hurt me to see her. Like, I would see her crying uh, many times, um, and it did hurt me. But I had a very proud heart at this time, and so I would kind of just push the emotions away. And I remember my mother would always tell me, I am praying for you. And part of me would hear this, and I would get very angry. I wouldn't admit to myself that I was addicted at this time. And I would just think that I did not need her help, and I did not need any prayers. But then there was this other part of me, uh, a little bit deeper down, and I would never admit it at the time, that this part of me hoped, desired, wished that whoever this God she was praying to did exist, and that perhaps he would help me. Um, over time, I began to resent not only the addiction, but resented myself uh, for letting it be so. Uh, I changed a lot during this time. The love in my heart grew very cold. I became very angry. I became very careless. I was getting into fights. I was stealing. I was losing myself to drugs. I was not myself anymore. And I just want to highlight right now that the reason God calls us to be sober is not because he doesn't want us to have fun. And it's not because he's trying to restrict us or trying to make us legalistic. But it is truly because he knows that in the end, alcohol and drugs will destroy us. He is our loving father, and I promise that he is protecting us. A few years into this drug addiction, I also found myself pregnant. At this time, I quit for the sake of my coming son, but this was around this time that I started falling into an abusive relationship. I was 16 years old at this time. Being a dropout of school, constantly called by many people a dropout of school, and also just knowing that I was addicted to drugs has damaged my sense of self-worth and my identity so much that when this abuse began, I just took it. I couldn't see at this point in my life how I deserved a better form of love. To me, this was the most that I deserved, and so I just let it be. Over time, things started feeling, getting very dark. Um, this was probably one of the darkest periods in my life, and I found myself trapped in this life that I had created for myself that I did not want to be in. And for me, the only way that I could see out at this time was to take my life. And I remember one night it got so dark, and I was, lying on my, I was sitting on my bedroom floor, and I was just crying. And I started crying out to God. And you see, I considered myself an atheist at this time. But even atheists will look to God when they have lost hope. And I was crying out to God. And I didn't really know what God I was praying to or if he even did exist. Um, all I knew was that I just needed help. And I just remember saying, God, if you are real, then show yourself to me now. And get me out of this, please. And uh, I cried throughout the whole night. And um, as soon as morning was starting to get closer, I walked out of my room and I went to my living room. And I don't really know why I did this. I have no explanation for it. But I went into my living room and I sat down. And um, the sun was starting to come up now. And the first lights of dawn were starting to come in through the window. And I looked across this dimly lit room and my eyes fell across a picture. 
It was a picture that had been in my house for a very long time. You see, my mom was a Catholic slash Christian, and, um, but I'd never really paid any attention to this picture before. It had always been there, but I'd never looked at it. I'd never noticed it. And now in this room that was slowly filling up with light, it was all that I could see. And this was the photo. And I remember staring at this picture. It was about this size from across the room. And I remember looking at it, and I started thinking to myself, who are you? I have heard about you growing up. I have seen so many different photos about you, heard so many different people talking about who they think you are, but who actually are you? And do you care? I sat there for some time. Um, it was morning now, and I started feeling very tired. So I got up to the living room. I went back into my room. I laid in bed and I fell asleep. And in my sleep, I had a dream. It was a dream unlike any dream that I'd ever had in my whole life. I dreamt that I was loved. There was a man in my dream. He was very kind, and uh, you can use that word kind, but this was a completely different kind of kind, and he told me that everything was going to be okay. And as he said that, I felt this love just fall, just pour over me in my dream, this love that I'd never heard before, felt before. Um, it was an unconditional love, an eternal love. It was a love that before this moment, I did not even know it existed. It was my first taste of this unconditional love. And then I woke up, and I believe that this dream was a dream sent from God to allow me to catch just a small glimpse of how much he truly loves me. And I believe that the man in that dream was an angel. Uh, I still didn't fully know who God was at this time in my life, but I had just learned that I was deeply and unconditionally loved. Jeremiah 31.3 says, Long ago the Lord said to Israel, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. With unfailing love I have drawn you to myself. This is the love that God has for all of us, and this is the love that draws us closer to him. As I said, this was a dark time in my life, and my circumstances around me were still very dark, but I had just learned that I was loved. And I wanted to explore this further. I wanted to know this God more. And so I chose at this time not to take my life. And I gave life another chance. Um, I grew very close to God at this time. And uh, I started growing closer to him, learning more of his love to me. And at this time, a conviction fell upon my heart. A conviction that was saying to me that there were some things and some people that I needed to leave behind. Uh, I now believe that God was real, but a choice was set before me. Do I stay in spiritual Egypt? Do I stay in this slavery to sin, this thing that is my whole world, all that I have ever known? Or do I leave everything that I have ever known and follow this God that I've just met on this journey towards the promised land? Leaving my past behind required a belief that whatever God had for me in my future was better than anything I could possibly leave behind. And it required faith. But what exactly is faith? Ellen White puts it this way. What is faith? It is simply taking God at his word. It is believing that God will do just as he has promised. Coming back to the Hebrew slaves in Egypt, and I'll continue with my story a little bit later on, they too had to make this choice. God had just given them a promise, a promise of a land better than anything that they could possibly leave behind. And now all they had to do was decide, do we trust God? Do we have faith? Leave all, that we be, um, leave all we've known behind and do we go with him? I think most of us know how this story goes. Uh, after God performs many miracles through Moses, the Egyptian leader, you know, the Pharaoh, um, finally decides to set the Hebrews free. And the Hebrews all leave slavery. But as they're gone, Pharaoh soon changes his mind. He sends an army of Egyptians after them. And so the Hebrews are running away, and they soon find themselves at this place with no point on escape. On one side, they have this Egyptian army coming after them. And on the other side, they have the whole ocean, the Red Sea. In Exodus 14, 16, the Lord speaks to Moses and he says, pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And then Exodus 14, 21 to 22 says, then Moses raised his hand over the sea. The Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry land. 
So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. God can make a way out of every single situation. The Hebrews walked through the ocean. The Egyptians ran after them. And when the Hebrews were safely on the other side, God closes this ocean over the Egyptians. And this mighty act of God births the first song ever found in the Bible. It is a song sung by Moses. It's a song of God's majesty and their victory. And it's found in Exodus 15. But I want to highlight a very important fact. When the Hebrews got to the other side of the ocean, they didn't arrive to the promised land straight away. And I don't know if I was a Hebrew slave at this time and I was walking through this amazing miracle um, through the open ocean. I would be walking through that ocean and I would be thinking to myself, I wonder what is on the other side of this. But when they got to the other side, they quite literally just found themselves at more desert. They had a very long journey ahead of them. And it was a journey full of many trials and obstacles. You know, there were, uh, there were trials of hunger, trials of thirst. There was threats of war. And at every single trial, they had to make a choice. Do we continue on this journey towards the promised land? Or do we run back to Egypt? Do we run back to slavery? You see, this decision, it's not a decision that is made just once in the Christian life. It is a daily decision. And many times along this journey, the Hebrews were tempted to run back to slavery. You see, God could get them out of Egypt, but he could not get Egypt out of them. They had to make a choice. And this is a choice that requires faith. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. Friends, we are looking for that same city as well. A city with eternal foundations, an everlasting city, one that is designed and built by God. We are all spiritual Hebrews. And we are all on that journey towards the promised land. And what the word Hebrew actually means in Hebrews um, says Ivrim, and then it's translated back as crossing over. And that is all that we are doing. We are crossing over from this land into the heavenly promised land. Uh, but we have not arrived there yet. Uh, every day we are going to face trials and obstacles. And every day we're going to have to make a choice. Do we run back to Egypt? Do we run back to this sin? Do we run back to slavery? Or do we continue on this journey towards the promised land? This journey is not necessarily the easiest one. God promises a safe landing, not a calm passage, but it is certainly the one with the most beautiful destination. What are you going to choose today? Jesus is offering you forgiveness. He's offering you a new life. He's offering you a whole new identity. And if you accept, he promises you a place in the heavenly promised land. Do you accept? I know that I do. Coming back to my story, um, I was faced with a choice to either stay in uh, this spiritual Egypt or follow God in this journey towards the promised land. And I chose to leave. I left all that I knew at this time behind. Um, I left the abusive relationship I was in. You know, although this relationship was bad, it still was not easy to leave. It was a painful thing to do. I left all my friends at this time. You know, these friends were my whole world. You know, when you're a teen, your friends are everything to you. Uh, but I left them behind. They were lovely people, but I knew that if I stayed there, it was only a matter of time before I would end up back in drug addiction. So I left those friends behind. I left everything that God convicted me to leave, took Jesus by the hand and said, lead me wherever you go. And um, I just need to say right now that this has not been a perfect journey. I have slipped many times along the way, and honestly, I still do. Uh, it has not been an easy journey. It's been a difficult journey. And at times, it has been a very lonely journey. But it has been the most beautiful journey that I have ever set on. Um, I still haven't arrived at the promised land, quite clearly. I am still here. But along this journey, God has proved himself faithful. Um, he replaced all this old toxic group of friends that I left behind with a beautiful church family. Um, he took all my feelings of worthlessness with a knowledge that I am deeply and unconditionally loved. 
Uh, other things that he did, he also took me from being someone who was a dropout and a drug addict to, as I said before, just finishing my degree within a month. And um, that's not at all to boast in myself, honestly. Had God not intervened, I'd probably still be way back there doing nothing. But it's just to say that God takes people that have no dreams for themselves and who everything believes that um, everyone, no one believes that they could have any possible dream for themselves. And he gives them a new dream and he gives them a new life. And um, above all this, somehow God, out of the darkest period in my life, brought my greatest and my most treasured blessing. God is good. His promises are true. And God is faithful. Um, as C.S. Lewis puts it, there are far, far better things ahead than any we leave behind. God has far better things for us than anything we could possibly want for ourselves. Let us pray. Dear God, I just want to thank you because you are a God who is faithful and you always keep your promises. And I thank you because even at times though we don't understand, your ways are always greater than our own. And you always have something better for us than we could possibly leave. So Father, I just pray right now for the conviction and the strength to leave behind spiritual Egypt. And I just pray that you would give us the courage and knowledge that you are with us to continue on this journey towards the promised land. I ask all this in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. This message was made available by the Watara Seventh-day Adventist Church. For more resources like this, visit waitarachurch.org.au.
I am bound for the promise land. That was Bound for the Promised Land by Matt and Josie Minicus. Portraying someone else's notions Of what your life should be It seems there's no way you can make it And you think you just can't take it The answer is such a mystery You can hand it over to him Start all over again Give up all your worries Give up all the pain Give up all the guilt and the shame To the one who gave us life With love he made the sacrifice Give them love in Jesus' name. There are just no words to say how I feel, and wishful thinking just won't heal this hurt inside of me. Only He knows what I'm all about. All my fears and all my doubts I haven't been all I could be And I don't want to wait another day I know in my heart He's the way I'll give up all my worries Give up all the pain Give up all the guilt and the shame To the one who gave us life With love he made the sacrifice I'll give him love in Jesus' name Jesus died Give up all the worries, give up all the pain, give up all the guilt and the shame. To the one who gave us life, with love he made the sacrifice, give them up in Jesus' name. Melody Shelton Firestone sang, Give Them Up. Coming up next, his song will be singing, Household of Faith.
other at any cost, unselfishly. Psalms 119 differs from all other psalms in several ways. First, it is the longest psalm with 176 verses, each part denoted by one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and each of these containing eight verses. Second, almost all verses mention God's law in some way. As each part is read, the relevant Hebrew letter is pronounced first, indicating the first letter of that part. Let's listen to William Ackland as he reads Psalm 119 from his paraphrase of the Bible called The Gift. Aleph. Happy are those who are blameless, for God's law is the guide of their life. Happy are those who live by his testimonies, whose hearts always yearn after him. They do not indulge in iniquity. They walk in the ways of the God. You have instructed us to keep your precepts, giving them first place in our lives. Oh, I want the direction of my life to be directed by your statutes. Then I will not have cause for shame when I observe your holy commandments. I will praise you with singleness of purpose when I make all your judgments my own. I have determined to keep your statutes. Do not abandon me now. Bet. How can a young man live a pure life? By living in harmony with your word. I have always put you first in my life, so do not let me stray from your commandments. I have made your word the centre of my life so that I will be shielded from the evil one. I will praise you, O Lord. Instruct me in your statutes. I have made known with my lips all the judgments you have spoken. I have rejoiced in the wonder of your testimonies, far more than all the wealth of the world. I will reflect on your precepts and think closely on your ways. My delight will be in your statutes, and I will not forget your word. Gimel, shower your blessings on your servant, that I may live in harmony with your word. Take the mist from my eyes that I may see marvellous things from your law. I am just a sojourner on the earth, so I need your commandments to guide me, the passion of my soul is to know your judgments all the time. You discipline the proud, the cursed, those who turn away from your commandments. Lift the shame of opprobrium and scorn from us, for I have purposed to keep your testimonies. Princes sit and pass judgment on me, but my strength is found in your statutes. Your testimonies buoy me up. They counsel me to live truly for you. Dalit. My soul is cast into the dust. Revive me, O Lord, by your word. I have stated that you are my God, 
and you answered me. Now, teach me your statutes. Enlighten me to know your precepts, and then I shall ponder on your powerful works. My soul sags from the weight of grief. Please strengthen me by your word. Keep me from habits of deceit, and graciously grant me your law. I have determined to walk in the path of truth. Your judgments are a signpost before me. I will cling to your testimonies and never let them go. So please keep me from shame, O Lord. I will be quick to obey all your commandments, for you have given me the way of freedom. Hey, teach me, O Lord, the meaning of your statutes, and I shall obey them till the end of my days. Give me an understanding mind, and I shall keep your law. I shall keep it wholeheartedly. Keep me always under the guidance of your commandments, for that will be the joy of my life. Implant in me a longing for your testimonies, and guard me from the snare of covetousness. Train my eyes not to look at futile things, and energize me to live according to your word. Anchor your word deep within my soul, for I want to respect you in everything I do. Do not let the disgrace I dread stain my life, for your judgments are good. I long to know your precepts, O Lord. Renew my desire to live for you. Vav. May you extend your mercy to me, O Lord, and your salvation as your word has promised. I will then have a defence against those who heap scorn on me, for I trust implicitly in your word. Please do not take the word of truth away from me, O Lord, for I trust in your ordinances. Thus I shall keep your law day by day for as long as my life lasts. I will live my life with a sense of freedom, for my life will be based upon your precepts. I will champion your testimonies before rulers, and in doing so I will not be ashamed. I revel in your commandments that I love more than I can say. I will affirm your commandments which keep me close to you, and I will meditate on your statutes each day of my life. Zion Remember your word to your servant, which has given me a reason for hope. It has cheered me up when I was down, for your word has reinvigorated my life. Let them ridicule me if they will, but that will not divert me from your law. I have learned of your judgments from far distant times, O Lord. These have given me much encouragement. When I look around me, I am greatly frustrated because the wicked trample upon your law. Your statutes have inspired me to sing wherever I make my home. When I awake in the night, I think of you, and I promise to always keep your law. This has become my practice, helping me to keep your precepts. Het, you are the centre of my life, O Lord. I have promised to keep your words. I have implored your blessing with my whole heart. Be merciful to me in harmony with your word. I thought about the direction of my life, then turned to your testimonies. I decided to act quickly, not delaying to keep your commandments. Even though my enemies bind me securely, I will not forget your law. I will leave my bed in the middle of the night to praise you, for I am grateful for your righteous judgments. I have chosen my friends from those who reverence you, from those who keep your precepts. The earth shows many evidences of your love, so teach me your statutes, O Lord. Tet, I could not be happier with the way you have treated me, for you have blessed me according to your word. Teach me how to judge wisely, to judge according to your commandments. Before troubles came upon me, I went astray, but now I am safe, for I keep your word. You are good, and all you do is good. 
I want you to teach me your statutes. My arrogant enemies have smeared me by a lie, but my aim is to keep your precepts with all my heart. Their hearts are insensitive to others, but my delight is your law. When I am chastised, it is good for my character, for in my troubles I learn more of your statutes. The law that comes from you is far better to me than piles of silver and mounds of gold. Yud Your very hands have created me, so please give me an understanding mind that I may learn your commandments. My fellows who respect you will be happy in my presence because I have put your word at the centre of my life. It is clear to me, O Lord, that your judgments are righteous, and it is because of your love for me that you have allowed troubles to come. Cover me, O Lord, with your kind mercy, in harmony with your word to me. Let the blessings of daily life be mine, that I may be sustained, for your law is the delight of my life. Let the arrogant be taught a lesson, for maligning me without a reason. But as for me, I will think deeply on your precepts. May those who fear you have respect for me, those who are familiar with your testimonies. Let me be faultless in respect to your statutes, that I may not be accused of sin. Calf, I desperately long for your salvation, and my hope is in your word. My eyes are becoming sore from seeking your word, and I say, when will you comfort your child? I am like a shriveled up wineskin in the smoke, but I still do not forget your statutes. How long will my life be, O Lord? When will you punish those who persecute me? When will the arrogant stop harrying me? What they are doing is condemned by your law. All your commandments are authoritative. Please help me, for I am pursued without good reason. My enemies have almost hounded me to death, but in all my troubles I did not renounce your precepts. Give me new life again, O Lord, for you love me, that I can follow the testimony that you have spoken. Lamed Your word stands firm forever in heaven, O Lord. Your faithfulness is renewed to each generation. You created the earth, and it stays where you placed it. It continues to this day in harmony with your ordinances, for all people are your servants. If I had not made your law the guide of my life, I would have succumbed when the hard times came. I will never forget your precepts, for they have shown me the way of life. I belong to you, O Lord, so please save me, for I have desired to keep your precepts. The wicked wait to ambush and destroy me, but my mind will be focused on your testimonies. I have seen how beautiful are the things you have made, but your commandments are even more majestic. Mem How I love your law. It is in my thoughts throughout the day. By your commandments, O Lord, I am wiser than my enemies, and there never is a time when they do not enclose me. I understand things better than my teachers, for your testimonies are where I gain my wisdom. I understand even more than the aged among us, because I have followed your precepts. I have chosen not to go down the path of evil, so that I may live out the principles of your word. I have not ignored your judgments, for you have been my teacher. Your word has inspired me. It is sweeter than honey in my mouth. It is through your precepts that my understanding grows, and I have learned to hate everything evil. Non. Your word is a lamp as I journey through life, shining a bright light onto my pathway. 
I have vowed to you, confirming that I will keep your righteous judgments. I am hounded and harried, so reinvigorate me by your word. Accept, O Lord, the praise of my mouth, and please teach me your judgments. My life seems to lurch from one danger to another, but in all my troubles I do not forget your law. The wicked keep trying to trap me, yet, even so, I have not wandered from your precepts. Your testimonies I regard as my inheritance, for they bring great joy to me. I have made it a practice to live by your statutes each day to the end of my life. Summer. <laughs> I hate those who don't mean what they say. But as for me, I love your law. You are my hiding place, my protector. My hope centres in your word. Leave me alone, you evil tempters, for I have determined to keep the commandments of God. Keep me motivated to fulfil your word, O Lord, and do not let me depend on false hopes. Uphold me, O Lord, and I shall be safe with you, and I shall always obey your statutes. You cannot save those who turn their backs on your statutes, for they have deceived themselves by going the wrong way. You reject the wicked when refining gold. I do love your testimonies. When I think of your greatness, I tremble and quake, and I am in awe of your judgments. Iron. I have lived justly and righteously. Do not leave me to the devices of the wicked. Go guarantor for your servant for my good. Do not let the arrogant man torment me. My eyes are growing weak from seeking your salvation and your perfect and righteous word. Deal with me according to your love and teach me how to live your statutes. I am your servant, O Lord. Give me an understanding mind that I may comprehend your testimonies. The time has come for you to act, O Lord, for mankind has regarded your law as nothing. But I love your commandments more than gold, even the finest gold. All your precepts show the right way. They have taught me to hate the way of evil. Pay. Your testimonies, O Lord, fill me with wonder, for I am determined to keep all of them. Your word enlightens our minds. It gives wisdom to the simple. I pant for your word like the deer pants for water, for I was thirsty for your commandments. Look upon this child of yours and be kind to me, as you are to those who love your name. Guide my steps by your perfect word and let me not be overcome by wickedness. Rescue me from the attacks of man so that I may keep your precepts. Shine your glorious face upon me and teach me your statutes. My tears are an ever-flowing stream. Men trample your law under their feet. Sadi, you are holy, O Lord, and your judgments are right. Your testimonies that you have given to the world are trustworthy and the essence of goodness. I am very zealous for your word, for my enemies have disregarded your commandments. Your word has been tried and found pure. I have made it the guide of my life. I am insignificant and rejected, but I will never forget your precepts. Your holiness is everlasting, and your law is truth. I am in trouble and in bitterness of spirit, yet your commandments bring delight into my life. The goodness of your testimonies will last forever. Give me an understanding heart and I shall live. Cough. I reach out to you with my whole being. Hear me, O Lord, and I will keep your statutes. I raise my voice to you. Say me, Lord, and I will keep your testimonies. I rise up from my bed before the new day dawns and cry out for you to be with me 
for my hope is in your word. I lie awake on my bed all night so that I have more time to think of your word. Hear my voice, O Lord, for you love me. Revive my spirits by your trustworthy word. I see evil men are coming closer to me, but they are so far from your law. I know you are near to me, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth indeed. Concerning the testimonies you have given, I know that these are eternal. Resh, please have pity on me in my trials and save me, for I have not forgotten your law. Be my advocate and my saviour. Give me a new spirit in harmony with your word. The wicked cannot be saved in their wickedness, for they have no interest in your statutes. I cannot count your many blessings, O Lord. Please revive me with your judgments. Those who torment me and hate me are many, yet this does not turn me away from your testimonies. The ways of the treacherous man disgust me, for they are so far from living by your word. Remember how I love your precepts. Give me new life, O Lord, for you love me. Every part of your word is truth, and each one of your righteous judgments is eternal. Shin. The nobles of the land are set against me for no reason, but what amazes me is your word. I rejoice in your word, for in it I have found a great treasure. Lying is repulsive to me, but I am devoted to keeping your law. I praise you seven times each day to acknowledge your righteous judgments. The peace of God is with those who love your law, and nothing will cause them to lose their way. Lord, I am depending on your salvation, and daily I fulfil your word. My heart is fixed on your testimonies, and I love them more than I can say. I keep your precepts and your testimonies, for my life is ever open to you. Tav May my prayer ascend to you, O Lord. Give me a mind that understands your word. Let my prayer of supplication rise up before you and say me in harmony with your word. My lips shall sing your praises, for you have taught me your statutes. My tongue shall also tell of your word, for holiness is the essence of your commandments. Let your strong right hand help me, for I have chosen to live by your precepts. I long for your salvation in my life, O Lord, and I delight to keep your law. Give me that precious thing called life, and I shall praise you. May your judgments help me to live for you. I have wandered from you just like a little lost lamb. So seek your servant, for I have not forgotten your commandments. This program has been brought to you by 3ABN Australia Radio.